There are a lot of movies in my home DVD collection that are part of a series, like Star Wars or Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, The Matrix, Alien, Alien vs. Predator, Predator, <laughs> James Bond, uh, Mission Impossible, and of course, the entire Marvel franchise. Some writers and directors, when they're making a sequel, they'll make a consideration for the audience so that even if you didn't see the other movies, you won't be lost in this one. Sure, it's a sequel, but it's also a standalone. You'll be fine. Other films, it's almost crucial it, in watching the movie that you first watch the ones that came before it. Otherwise, you'll be lost. You won't know who the characters are. You won't know what everybody is doing. Well, Easter is approaching, and we're all excited to begin a series of stories for Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. I would like to remind you that the New Testament is also a sequel to the Old Testament. You see, by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, the reason why many hundreds of people flock to him and listen to him and believe in him is because they were all ready for him to come. People have been waiting for the Messiah. And so jumping into Jesus' story is a little like starting in the middle of a good book. Sometimes you have to go back in order to go forwards. Who is Jesus? The Apostles' Creed, something that gets uh, recited in church a lot. And the very first line of the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Meaning, this is a belief. A Christian believes in Jesus. A Christian follows the Christ. Christianity is an Abrahamic monotheistic religion based on the life and teachings of Jesus. It is the world's largest and most widespread religion with roughly 2.4 billion followers, comprising about 31% of the earth's population. Christians are estimated to make up a majority of the population in 157 countries. Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God, whose coming as the Messiah was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible and recorded in the New Testament. In other words, Christianity is not about a set of abstract beliefs or rules. Christianity is about a person. And so the identity of Jesus is a very important thing to understand. Because if the claims about Jesus are true, then they can't be ignored. And anyone who refutes these claims will have to one day answer for the impact that it'll have on everyone's life. So in our creed, it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. That opening line calls him Jesus Christ. Now, you might remember an old story from your Sunday school days. The prophet Samuel was told to go to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse, where one of his sons would be anointed as king. Psalm 89.20 says, I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Have you ever wondered what anointing is? Maybe you've seen it at a baby dedication, right? You run a bead of oil across the baby's forehead. Well, this ritual is in the Bible. It involved very fragrant plants and spices that made this rich oil that you would pour on special objects or people. And this was called anointing oil. But it wasn't just a few drops. When King David was anointed, as well as other prophets or kings or priests in the Old Testament, it wasn't just a few drops that were sprinkled on their forehead. It was poured down all the way past their beard to their robes. So drenched would be a better word. The verb anoint is spelled meshach in Hebrew and meshka in Aramaic. It is a three root word, mem, sheen, and keth. It's a word like water because the first letter of the word is mem and that word picture of mem means water. It also looks like water. So the title Christ means anointed one. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Mashiach, and in Aramaic, Mashika. So just like King David, Jesus is anointed with water 
saturated, if you will, at his baptism. And he was also anointed by the Holy Spirit when those standing near saw something like a dove floating down upon him. Look at what comes next after David's anointing. I found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes and before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offering forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. Look at all those promises for King David's reign. He's going to crush his enemies. God's love will be with him. His name will be exalted, and that God would establish King David's throne forever. Queen Elizabeth was 96 when she died, and for many, people thought that her reign would never end, and perhaps in many ways it won't. You know, her son Charles is now king, and I believe following him will be his son, William. But in truth, those last verses of Psalm 89 are not about King David. Look again. Verse 26 says, He shall cry to me, You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever in his throne as the days of the heavens. Doesn't that sound more to you like Jesus? In his last hours, Jesus is the one who prayed to the Father. And David was never a firstborn. In fact, he's Jesse's youngest son. Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Sounds very similar, doesn't it? And there it is again, the phrase, Jesus Christ. The word Christ is a title. It's not a surname. We use Christ in, in the Greek for anointed rather than the Hebrew, but they both mean anointed one. So when you use the name Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah, what that means is that Jesus is God's anointed Savior or his Savior King, because that's what the words really mean. David was anointed as King and given promises that his kingdom would continue forever. And in calling Jesus the Christ, we are saying that Jesus is also the anointed king. Look at Mark 8. Peter watches Jesus feed 4,000 people and heal a blind man. And it says, And Jesus went, to, went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. In other words, you are the Lord's anointed, just like David. What else is similar between Jesus and David? Well, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. We know that from the Christmas story. In fact, they even call Bethlehem the city of David because Bethlehem is where David was born and it's where he was anointed. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, which is also David's tribe, not to mention the fact that the family tree of Jesus in Matthew proves that he is a direct descendant of David. So when we say things like the Apostles' Creed, that we believe in Jesus as Christ, what we are saying is we believe that Jesus is the anointed one and that he is the king. All the prophecies that were foretold about David, they are fulfilled in Jesus. But don't you think it's a bit strange that Jesus is given all this authority and power, and yet he suffers and dies on a cross? If the Hebrews were waiting for a king, he certainly didn't act like a king or die like a king. Well, we can answer this question as well by looking at the Old Testament. This time we look at the book of Daniel. Daniel 7 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel is giving us a picture of the end of days, very similar to John's vision in Revelation. And what do we see? You see two characters, one called the Ancient of Days, this is God, and another character called the Son of Man. And God gives this Son titles, everlasting dominion, glory, kingship, all the peoples on earth will serve him. Well, now if we skip to the New Testament, look at this miracle story from Mark chapter 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came to him, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could got, not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were questioning within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take your bed, and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The name, Son of Man, is the name that Jesus takes for himself. Just about every time this title appears in the Bible. It's being used by Jesus to describe himself. Son of man is how Jesus identifies. I bet you didn't know this, but Lady Gaga is not her real name. (laughs) It's actually Stephanie uh, Germanta. Drake, his real name is Aubrey. Uh, Shania Twain, her real name is Eileen. Snoop Dogg, not his real name. Uh, His real name is Calvin. And Reese Witherspoon's real name is Laura. But before Jesus, this isn't just some stage name that he comes up with. It has meaning. It has substance. Jesus uses this title to suggest that he is the one from Daniel chapter 7. He is the one who is given kingship, dominion, and power by the Ancient of Days. Remember in our story, Jesus not only heals, but he forgives a paralyzed man of his sins. And he says, just so that you know, the Son of Man has authority on earth also to forgive sins. So not only is he claiming to be the one from the book of Daniel, he is also claiming authority over sin. And the Hebrews know only God can make that claim. Only God can forgive sin. And I get it. It's a very different picture of what we think of when we think of a king. They thought Jesus would be this great military or political leader. He would be the one that would overthrow the Roman occupation. But as Peter and his disciples are witnessing firsthand, this Christ isn't like what they expected. And right after Peter makes his big confession... Jesus turns their world upside down again. And it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer these many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Jesus predicts his death and his resurrection three times in the Bible. And every time he does that, He uses the Son of Man title. The most famous one we all know is Mark 10. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How did the Hebrews miss this? How come those who knew their prophecy so well missed the fact that the Son of Man would suffer and die and that he would not act like a traditional king? Well, it actually has to do with another prophecy that's in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 53, the chapter that talks about the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 reads like 
an eyewitness account of Jesus' trial and death. Listen. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men would hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. Who is that chapter talking about? Jesus. This is the role of the anointed that the Jews had overlooked. Messiah means Savior. And they thought that meant save from the Romans. But that last verse, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. The suffering servant was going to do way more than save people from physical suffering at one point in history. That is such a small goal for God. He was going to bear the sins of the world and he was going to make atonement. Only a king can do that. Only a God can do that. So who is Jesus? Well, what did we learn? He is the anointed, which is to say he is the Messiah. He is also a king. His reign has no end. He is also the prophesied son of man. He is the prophesied suffering servant. And the title, Christ, as the Apostles' Creed says, he is the only Son and our Lord. The Apostles' Creed talks about Jesus as the only Son of God. That means that the relationship between Jesus and God is very unique. Jesus is uniquely connected to and proceeds or is begotten by the Father. The Word suggests one of a kind. Jesus is not a creature like us, Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Jesus became God, incarnate, as a man for our sake. Philippians 2 helps us understand this. Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When we call Jesus our Lord, we are basically confessing that he is God. The word Lord is the Greek form of the Hebrew Adonai. Throughout the Old Testament, Adonai is a title for God himself. And his word, Adonai, it's translated as Lord. So when we refer to Jesus as Lord, we're using a word that was once used to refer to God. Jesus is given the same status as God himself. Matthew 8. When he came down from the mountains, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. A few chapters later, when Jesus walked on water, Matthew 14, it says, When they got out of the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, but she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. The mother of James in Matthew 20, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. How do these people all react to Jesus? They call him Lord, they bow before him, and they worship him. People who are raised their entire lives that they can only worship one God and call God Lord, they prostrate themselves in front of Christ because they recognize, they recognized, they were there. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. 
I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said that sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who also says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. For some of you, this may mean turning to God for the very first time, accepting the claims of Jesus as the Son of God, who came as a suffering servant to die for your sin. You can accept the offer of God's love and forgiveness in Jesus by believing Jesus' death that he resurrected three days later for you by turning from sin and becoming a follower. And notice, in the Apostles' Creed, I believe it takes it even further by just adding one small word, the word our, our Lord. The Creed confesses not only that Jesus is the Lord, but he is our Lord. Being a Christian says that Jesus has a right to lordship over our life. Being a Christian involves personal obedience and loyalty to Jesus as our Lord. If Jesus is truly your Savior, then he must be your Lord. As we head into Easter, I want you to think about that Jesus is the Lord of your life. How do you do that? Well, I mean, what does that mean? How do, you, how do you live with Jesus as your Lord? Well, if you go back a moment, we could go back to Romans. We just left that book. It should still be fresh in our memory. Romans 12 says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. You know what that means? It means show enthusiasm for God. Be on fire for him. I believe having a fully devoted heart is one of the characters that we need more as a Christian. A devoted heart does not just study and read their Bible. It means you're enthusiastic about obeying it. Serving the Lord should be an act that is done willingly and expectantly. Serving the Lord should be one of the happiest moments of your life. We need to be excited and passionate about serving the Lord. And let's face it, we are the most blessed and most wealthy Christians whom ever has lived. And so when Paul is giving his instruction in the book of Romans, they didn't have cars that they could drive themselves to church. They didn't have nice printed Bibles. They didn't have seminary educated pastors or PowerPoint or hymnals or all the other thousands of resources that are available to us. And Paul tells them, right? Paul tells them, living under Roman occupation, he tells them, don't be lazy. <laughs> what would he say to us? That means share the gospel over the phone, at lunch dates, with your family. Have you posted the times for Easter services? Or have you posted an Easter graphic yet to your social media? How often do you post about your faith? or your church, or your experiences in your faith over social media? How often do you post a Bible verse to another church member that might encourage them in a troubled time? We serve God when we serve others. That was demonstrated to us by Jesus, who washed the feet of his disciples. And in that same story, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This Easter, we celebrate the cross and all that the Christ has done for us. But even now, before that day gets here, I would like to encourage you to ask Jesus what you can do for him. How can you best serve your Lord?
be kind. Be kind to someone. You know, the absolute best way we can serve God and others is to be kind. Smile. Don't snap at the sales clerk for taking too long. Don't demand to have your own way. Don't berate the telemarketer. Don't be rage-filled or an irritated driver. Be the kind of person who will take the first step towards being loving. Remember someone. Send a birthday card or a gift to a lonely widow or widower. Let them know their special day is still special. Call someone who's feeling under the weather or going through a difficult time or experiencing grief or loss. When you remember someone, you are being their friend. Pray for those in need. Don't generalize your prayers, be specific. Pray for those who you know are undergoing cancer treatment, for those who are moving, for those who are pregnant, for those who are trying to get pregnant, for widows, for orphans, for that neighbor, or for your enemy by name. Pray for the leaders of our nation by name. Share food. Invite a college student to your home for dinner. Fix snacks for the high school youth group to enjoy during their Bible study. Fix a meal for a new mom, or the people who just moved in next door, or someone who just got taken home from the hospital. Bake cookies, bread, or pie. Share your time. Sit and read to an elderly person or a child. Take someone to or from their doctor appointment or their chemo treatment. Volunteer to help the church secretary with some of her duties at church. Offer to prepare a class material for a Sunday school teacher. Read to the children at daycare. Volunteer at a kitchen, a thrift store, a women's shelter, a community center. Share your money. Give generously. Purchase items to send to missionaries in third world countries that they would otherwise not have access to. Sponsor a child in your church who might otherwise not be able to go to church camp or some other event. Purchase pizza or fast food gift cards to send to college students. Put together care packages for servicemen or the homeless. Share your stuff. Donate sports equipment, clothing, and household items to shelters, children's homes, and other organizations. Host a Bible study in your home. Even if you aren't the one who has to teach it, invite the youth group to enjoy your pool, your backyard, or your horses that are on your farm. Give away part of your garden's produce. Share your talents. Teach a Bible study. Offer to do hair and nails for the high school girls for their prom. Babysit for young parents so they can enjoy a date night now and then. Perform car maintenance or handyman chores for the elderly at your church, your neighborhood. Tutor a child or, a chi or those who are struggling at school. Help a young couple decipher what it means to have a reasonable budget. Teach others how to garden or sow or whatever it is that you are good at. And share the word. That means we need to learn the word. In order to share it, we need to learn it. Begin to give the wisdom of God to others who need it. Let them hear his voice. Jesus says in Matthew 13, then the righteous will shine like the sun. <laughs> Palm Sunday is coming. And then Good Friday. And then Easter. Church, this is now our time to shine. Let us not be slothful, but instead be fervent. Jesus is the Christ. He is God's anointed. Let us serve the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder that you are not only Lord of the world, you are Lord of our lives. And that by calling you Lord, we are calling you God. This Easter, we are reminded of the greatest gift of all, the gift of your son's life. That he came and lived not to overthrow Rome, that would happen on its own. Rome would topple from just being Rome. You know, your, your Messiah's goals were so much bigger. To topple sin, to defeat sin, to crush the enemy beneath its heel. Lord, as those of us who listen understand what it means to be a Christian and understand what it means to be saved by grace. May we go out into the world and show the faith and grace and love and forgiveness of Christ. 
We who are now forgiven, may we show forgiveness to others. We who are loved, may we love others. We who have been shown grace, may we show grace to others. We who realize that we are not perfect, that we are a work in progress, that we are still sinners, may we give leniency and grace to those who need it. That they might see the church not as a rod that corrects, but as arms that hold. May they feel the blood of Jesus that covers their sin. May they know what it means to be set free. This Easter, may hearts be set free. May lives be set free. May more knees bow and more tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, next Sunday we have Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday we have two services, 9.30 and 11. Good Friday, our services will be at 6.30 at night here in the sanctuary. It's a somber night, and I know some people like to uh, not attend because they feel like it's too sad because we talk about the cross, but I think you kind of have to have that moment. You have to have that moment of death in order to experience life, in order to experience rebirth, and to understand how excited and how amazing Resurrection Sunday is. Easter Sunday, we have three services, one at 7 o'clock. That's going to be at the Yacht Club flagpole. So we'll be out there at 7 a.m. We'll have a service for you. Uh, We'll have a program that'll have all the songs. We're going to sing and we're going to watch the sun come up. It's a beautiful service. And if you've never attended before, uh, it's, it's something that you should definitely do. We have two services back here in the sanctuary, the first at 9 and the second at 11. They're both at the top of the hour and they're both identical. Find the service that works the best for you and your family. Have a happy Easter.